Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, super excited that, that you're here on this Tuesday morning. My name is Sean Burns. I'm a program specialist for 3C REN. And I'm excited to help present non-residential tenant improvements and alterations today um, with Russ King, who's on the call. I'll introduce him uh, in a moment. But before we get started, um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about 3CRN and who we are, um, as well as a little bit more about our, our programs and upcoming offerings at the end of the training. Um, but before we get started, um, next slide, Russ. Um, just wanna make sure that everybody is um, on the same page for a Zoom. So this is a Zoom meeting. Um, so we can engage a little more and speak up and ask questions um, when needed, but we do ask that you please keep yourself muted. Um, you can use the chat to share your questions or comments. Um, and we will ask uh, sometimes if, if the question needs some clarity um, that you speak up and, and contribute uh, verbally to. But please do make sure that your full name is displayed or at least uh, first, first initial last name. Uh, that helps us take attendance and get you um, any learning units, whether that's AIA or ICC or this course. Perfect. Next slide. Yeah, there's um, animation. <laughs> yeah, we can can move past the animations. Great. I have a background behind me. Lovely Ojai <clears throat> Ojai Hills. Um, if you see anyone else on the call with a, a three CRN background like this, feel free to to ask us a question about our programs or send us a message in the chat. Um, here for you. Here to answer anything uh, you may have. Next slide. All right, so said through Siren, I introduced myself, but, but who are we? I'm sure I've seen a few of you on the call before, but just a quick reminder, um, 3C Rana and the Tri-County Regional Energy Network uh, is a collaborative partnership between San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. And we're, we're working towards improving uh, energy efficiency programming in our region through customized programs. Um, and that, that does include the energy code. Um, so we offer services, uh, free services for professionals and for, for households and community members, um, whether that's industry training events like this, technical and soft skills of events, um, energy code compliance support. And for, for households, we offer free and discounted uh, home upgrades to reduce energy use and improve comfort. Um, at residences. Next slide. Um, and just just a reminder that you know 3C Rent is funded by repair dollars um, that we all already pay on our utility bills. Um, so these go to the utilities, uh, go to the the California Public Utilities Commission, and then we get to reinvest them back into our community uh, to help strengthen our economy, invest locally in our workforce. Um, there are training programs um, and help create a market for energy efficiency, all while supporting some of our climate goals, our state climate goals and our local climate goals. Next slide. Um, and this, this little infograph uh, just <laughs> displays kind of our approach to energy and energy efficiency in our region. Um, we want to take a collaborative approach. So engage all sectors, from the public sector, from building safety staff, to the private sector, to um, architects, designers, contractors, and to folks um, who use these services, our households and, and everyday people, to understand uh, how energy touches the lives of everyone in our community. Um, but with that, we'll go to the next slide. And I'll introduce um, our instructor today, is our instructor today for non-resident Potential tenant improvements and alterations is Russ King with CalCERTS. Russ is a, one of our favorite instructors, um, has a depth of knowledge and um, expertise that, that he'll bring to you today. So Russ, I'll hand it off to you um, and we'll get started. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. All right. So welcome, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here on this uh, Tuesday morning. Um, this class is called Non-Residential Tenant Improvement and Alterations, and we're going to be talking about how those are 
affected by the 2019 California Energy Code or energy standards and how they're addressed, how they should be treated. Um, this class is primarily targeted towards building departments and, and sort of has some best practices and things like that for enforcement of the energy code as it applies to um, non-residential TIs and alterations, but it's, it's good for designers and, and installers and things like that as well. Okay, uh, this class is developed by Bayren. Uh, Bayren is the, is the Bay Area Regional Energy Network, similar to 3C REN. Um, and they have a nice cooperative uh, training agreement between the two organizations. And um, as Sean mentioned, I'm with CalCERTS. CalCERTS is the home energy rating system provider in California, too. And um, uh, my background is just energy codes and HVAC design and, and, and anything about energy, energy modeling and all that stuff. I've been doing it for quite a while. I enjoy teaching it. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Uh, my email is real easy. I'll give it to you at the end, but it's, it's russ at calcerts.com, real simple. All right, so let's dive into the material here. Um, first of all, an introduction. And we're gonna talk about the energy code compliance process real quick. Okay, so before we dive into the details of any specific part of the energy code, it's kind of a good idea to sort of understand the big picture. How do all the different um, entities fit into the process? Okay, so you've got the Energy Commission that develops the code. You have the enforcement agencies that enforce the code. You have the trades that follow the code. And then you have the public who sort of benefits from the code, as well as utilities who are very important in helping to do all of the above. Um, they provide a lot of funding for research and, and things like that to develop the code. So the, all those entities are very important and they all sort of work together to make it, to make it work, okay? Um, the first thing to realize about the code is there's different requirements, different kinds of requirements. The first sort of an umbrella over everything is what we call mandatory measures. Those are things that just pretty much always have to be met. There's a few exceptions to them, but there are things that they just, they're so cost effective, they're so important that they, they, they just have to be done. Okay. And those are things like what's the minimum efficiency that you're allowed to install for certain, you know, equipment like water heaters and furnaces and air conditioners and stuff like that. Those are mandatory measures, as well as certain insulation levels that you shouldn't go below. Uh, for certain types of assemblies and things like that. So that's mandatory measures, those sort of, um, that's like an umbrella over everything. And then underneath that is a bunch of other energy measures and there's two paths. Um, and the best way to describe these is the, the easy path in terms of complexity and then the more complex path. Um, and the difference is the easy path is a little less flexible. In order to make it simple, um, they've, they've made it a little bit more stringent, okay? But on the performance side, you can trade stuff off. But in order to do that, it requires a lot more complexity. It requires software. It requires an energy model to say, I'm gonna do this instead of this. Is that worth the same amount of energy and, and stuff like that? So the prescriptive path is basically a prescribed lift list of measures and it varies by climate zone. So you figure out which of the 16 climate zones you're in, your project is in, and then you just follow that list for, for lighting or mechanical or whatever you're doing. And it's pretty straightforward. And so if you choose the prescriptive path, those measures are essentially mandatory measures because you chose the prescriptive path. But if you don't like something in the prescriptive measures, you can say, well, how about if instead of doing this, I want to do something else that'll use that'll save the same amount of energy. Well, that's allowed. That's called the performance path. So that's the right side here. And basically what you have to do is you have to model the building and you say, okay, I'm going to do this instead of this. What's the ultimate, the final energy consumption of the building? Does it meet the requirements? Is as if I were to follow the prescriptive measures. Okay. So those those are just kind of two really important concepts or three counting mandatory measures. That's important to understand those. What we're going to talk about today is uh, TIs and alterations. Those are usually pretty simple projects compared to say building a whole new building from scratch. And so most of the TIs and um, alterations will follow the prescriptive path. They'll, they'll, be, they'll take the simple approach. So you have to do certain things, but do keep in mind, there's always the option, even for TIs and alterations, there's always the option to go the performance path. If there's something that you really don't wanna do, 
or what often happens is they get too far along down the project and realize they can't do something because they've, they've already installed the windows or they've already installed the HVC. And in order to comply, they have to sort of, as an alternative, do the performance path um, in order to, to make it comply. So that's, that's often what happens too. So, okay, um, let's see here. So one of the handouts, um, Sean, I think you linked those in the chat or something. Uh, one of the handouts that you have or you can, you can access is this guy here. This is, we call this the um, compliance process flow chart. And it's sort of a one page graphic of the overall compliance process for a commercial or non-residential building, okay, or project. Um, so you'll notice that there's um, this far end column here that's just kind of a, a, um, a flow step-by-step. -step. And then you've got these, these diagrams in here. Notice that the upper portion says plan check. So this would be a project where you have to submit plans. Um, it could be you know, a TI, you'd have to submit plans. For a completely new building, you'd obviously have to submit plans. And then it shows the two approaches here, okay? And then the lower portion is field inspection. So this really is talking about enforcement, right? So you got plan check up at the top, then you get your permit, and then you have field inspection down at the bottom, all right? So let's kind of dive into this, this handout real quick. So along the left-hand column, you've got this these steps, right? So the first step says start here. And then the first thing you have to do if you're doing a project is to figure out what are you supposed to do? What am I supposed to do in order to meet this, this, this requirements for this project? If it's a TI, what am I supposed to do to the lighting? What am I supposed to do to the mechanical? What am I supposed to do to the envelope, all right? So you have to figure that out first. That's documented on a form called the NRCC, the Certificate of Compliance, okay? Um, the next step is to specify the things that you need in order to meet those requirements. So on this NRCC, it's gonna tell you what kind of windows, what kind of mechanical, what kind of envelope measures are required. And then on the plans, you need to show those. So you have to specify those on the plans. Then the next step is to document that they've been installed. So you actually put them in the building and then have someone write down on a form document that you put in the right windows, that you put in the right insulation, that you put in the right mechanical. That's all done on a couple ways on the commercial side through a form called the NRCA, which is for acceptance testing or the NRCC checklist, okay? So the NRCC, it tells you what you're supposed to do. The NRCC checklist tells you that you've done it. So it's a way to document that it was done. And then last but not least is what was verified. So verification is often third-party verification by HERS raters, and that's done on an NRCV. All right, so let's take those steps, what's required, what's specified, what's installed, and what's verified. Let's take those steps and apply it to the actual process. So here we have the, the plan check process. And at the very beginning of the project, as I mentioned before, you have to choose whether you're gonna use the performance approach or the prescriptive approach. Um, for new buildings, you know, if you're building a new office building or something like that, you will generally go the performance approach. Um, in residential, you almost always go the performance approach for new construction, um, but it's more common in, in commercial to use the prescriptive approach, even for new construction, because there's a lot more flexibility in the non-residential prescriptive approach. But for what we're talking about today, alterations, we're almost always gonna go the prescriptive approach. It's, they're relatively simple projects, um, just an alteration, you know, just a lighting change, just an HVAC change out. Um, it's not really worth it to do a whole computer model and all that jazz. So, so just use the prescriptive approach. So um, for prescriptive approach, we've got certain sections of the code that apply. Here's those sections there. And you have certain forms, all right? I mentioned the NRCCs. Well, they're broken into the different components. So you got your NRCC envelope, mechanical lighting, and you'll use the forms that apply to your project. If you're not touching the plumbing system, you don't need to fill out any plumbing forms. If you're not touching the lighting system, you don't need to fill out any of the lighting forms. So what you're touching will determine, and when I say touching, I mean altering. What you're altering will determine which forms you need to fill out, all right? So those get filled out. A lot of times you'll get an, an energy consultant to help you do that. And then what those forms tell you that you need to do, it's a very good idea to make sure that information all gets put on the plans because the plans is where most of the trades go to look to find out what they're supposed to do. 
a lot of trades don't like to read all these eight and a half by 11 staple pages that get that get attached to the plans. That's too much work. They like to go straight to the plans and say, okay, what kind of water heater am I putting in? And they go and they look on the plans and it tells them. That's not always the most accurate way to do it, unfortunately. Um, so it's real important that that coordination happen, that, that whatever it says on the NRCCs um, gets on the plans. And that's a good thing for plan checkers to do too, is to compare the NRCCs and what it says, make sure that's on the plan somewhere that, so, so that it gets done, all right? So we'll talk about best practices uh, towards the end today. All right, so all that happens, it gets on the plans, they get through plan check, they get their permit, now they start building the building, okay? Oops. Oh, that's part of my slide. Oh, hold on a second. Okay, I'll go to here. So the permit happens, okay? The um, Then the measures, the features that go into the house, or the, sorry, the building, um, get broken into two basic categories. There's, there's um, stuff that has to be inspected by either a third-party inspector or the installer. There's special tests that have to be done, like duct leakage testing, airflow testing, um, uh, making that. Um, and then there's other stuff that are just verified by the building department. So we're gonna break those into two different categories. The stuff that's verified by the building department um, just gets checked on the NRCC forms, the checklist, and the building inspector does that. But there's a lot of measures that have to be tested, either by a third party inspector, like a HERS rater, or by a certified person, which can be the installer, so they can test their own work, but they have to be certified. Um, those are called acceptance tests. And that's just to make sure, it's kind of like, it's kind of like forcing commissioning to happen, sort of the traditional definition of commissioning, where you actually test a building before you, people occupy it. I mean, you don't just wanna plug in the lights, hook up the wiring, hook up the controls and walk away. You wanna make sure those controls work, make sure that they turn on at the right time, that they that the occupancy sensors work, that the um, any kind of daylighting controls are are sensing the right amount of daylighting before they turn off and things like that. So that's all acceptance testing. They don't expect building departments to do that, but it's a really good idea. And it's very important if building departments make sure that those acceptance tests and those HERS verification forms get completed. So at least you know that somebody did the test or at least is taking responsibility for having done that test, okay? People will sign stuff without actually doing the test. It's not a perfect world, but at the very least, collect those forms, make sure they're signed by somebody, okay? And then if it comes out later and find out that it wasn't installed correctly, we know who to go, who to go back to, okay? All right, so um, now let's talk about the, the specific energy code requirements as they apply to alterations and tenant improvements. All right, so let's define what an alteration is. When tenants move into a space that was previously conditioned and occupied by another tenant, any changes they make to that building are called alterations, all right? An alteration is a change to a building's water heating system, space conditioning system, indoor lighting, outdoor lighting, signs, lit, lit signs, um, or envelope. Any changes to those components that doesn't add square footage and volume, okay? So it's if it's not an addition. So if they're adding square footage and volume, that, that becomes something else called an addition. So an alteration is a change to all those things that doesn't qualify as an addition, all right? So it's sort of a weird definition in that, in that it's saying it's not one of these. So let's, what is an addition? Well, an addition uh, involves the creation of newly conditioned square footage and volume. So if you're making the building bigger, by adding square footage and volume, like pushing out a wall or conditioning an unconditioned warehouse or something like that, those are all considered additions. Those have a whole different set of rules that have to be followed. That's a different class, okay? We're talking about alterations today and tenant improvements that don't make the space bigger, all right? Uh, so converting an unconditioned warehouse into conditioned retail space, that's an addition, so that's not an alteration. Tenant improvements are alterations as long as they don't make the space bigger, okay? Um, we're gonna have, there's kind of two common types of TIs. Um, these aren't official definitions. These are just kind of, you know, what you'll typically see. And we just call them major tenant improvements and minor tenant improvements. So the difference is kind of how much work, how much change is being done to the building. So a minor tenant improvement is basically 
um, a new occupant moving into an existing condition space, okay? And all they're really doing is they're moving around some interior walls, maybe, maybe moving some supply registers and stuff like that, maybe changing the light switches, replacing some ceiling tiles and some light fixtures, okay? That's all they're doing. So it could be, you know, um, a, 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 re, a realtor's office moving into a former doctor's office or something like that. And so they're just, you know, kind of moving the walls around, making it a little more conducive to what their type of business is, maybe putting in a reception area. Not huge changes. They're not going to replace all the HVAC equipment and stuff like that. All right. So examples, converting a strip mall space from a retail space to an office space. All right. You've got a little uh, paint store and you're converting it into an office space, um, moving stuff around, moving lighting around, stuff like that. Converting an open floor plan office into more private offices. So you got this big open space and you wanna put smaller offices with doors on them so that they have privacy. So those types of things, those are minor TIs. A major TI would be um, restaurants. <laughs> restaurants always are a lot of work. So adding a restaurant to what where there wasn't one before is a, is a big deal. So you're gonna put maybe put a hard ceiling in where there used to be a T-bar. Maybe you're putting in a whole new different HVAC system. You're having to put in a bigger system because you got more loads. Maybe you're adding a huge kitchen hood and changing the ventilation system. You got all different kinds of lighting and controls are all gonna be different for a restaurant than they were say for a retail space, okay? So examples would be converting a little retail space into a high-end restaurant. Uh, converting a retail space into a dentist office that has individual exam rooms and all special kind of ventilation and stuff like that. So those are much more major uh, types of TIs, okay? How the energy code applies to those TIs depends on what you're doing. So the energy code is scope driven. What part of the energy code applies depends on what's being changed or added. So if you're not touching the lighting, don't worry about the lighting. If you're not touching the mechanical, don't worry about the mechanical. If you're not touching the envelope, don't worry about the envelope. It depends on what you're changing, what's being altered, all right? Alterations have many requirements that may or may not apply in any given case, depending on what is being altered. So the very first thing that you need to do, especially during the plan check process and, and developing the plans, is to figure out exactly what's being touched, okay? And that's where you'll see a lot of the plans will say, you know, E for existing, and they'll show a wall being removed and they'll show new for walls being added, figure out what's being changed, okay? That will determine which part of the energy code applies in that situation. Uh, once the scope is determined, then figuring out what to do is, is relatively straightforward, okay? But it needs to happen early in the process. That's very important, right? So the energy code follows the you touch it, you upgrade it philosophy. The energy code applies only to those portions or components of the system being altered, unless specifically stated, untouched portions or components generally need not comply with the energy code. All right, there's a couple little things um, that where you're not necessarily touching something, but the code does trigger a change to it. The best example of that is if you replace a rooftop package unit, okay, that's all you're doing, it's replacing the rooftop package unit, you're taking the other one off, setting a new one on there, you're not necessarily touching the ductwork, but because ductwork is so leaky out there, there is a section of the code that says, if you replace rooftop package units, you must seal the ducts if they're in unconditioned space. We'll talk more about that, but that's just an example of that sort of goes against the you touch it, uh, or if you don't touch it, you don't have to fix it kind of rule. There are a few little places where, where things do, do comply, uh, uh, do apply to the code. Uh, a good example of where you don't have to do something is if you're not touching the exterior walls at all of a building, leave them alone, okay? You don't have to do it. There's no, there's no energy code requirement that says you have to insulate this wall if you're not touching it, if you're not opening it up or something like that, okay? Some of the requirements have prescriptive exceptions or alternative measures that can be used. So there's, they give you some choices. So, so um, for example, if um, there's, there's a prescription required for cool roofing, cool roof material, if you're replacing a certain amount of roofing, um, there is an alternative that says, well, all right, so adding cool roof may just might make this building look funny or it might just doesn't seem to work because of the way the roof is constructed. So there's an alternative that says, well, add more insulation instead. So, so those are all kind of built into the code. So just be aware of those things as well. 
um, a good energy consultant will, will be able to, to guide you through this kind of stuff too. Um, there's a good table in the code I, that I recommend that you have it, you know, bookmarked or whatever, um, so you can find it easy. It's called table 100.0-A, and it's basically a map of the energy code. It has all the different occupancies here in the first column. So you've got non-res, you've got cover processes, you've got signs, and then below that you got residential, high-rise, and stuff like that. Okay, and then it talks about what part of that building. So you got envelope, HVAC, water heating, indoor lighting, outdoor lighting, electrical power, pools and spas, and solar-ready buildings. And then you've got your mandatory, prescriptive, and performance. Remember the three types of code we talked about. So here's all the sections. So it has it's a nice reference guide for all the sections. So if you wanna know what are the mandatory measures for water heating for a non-residential building, you got water heating and here you go. There's all the code sections right there. What are the prescriptive requirements? What are the performance requirements? There you go. What are the specific requirements for additions and alterations? And there you go right there, 141.0. All right, so that's a good reference tool. Make sure you have that handy. Uh, and then a question we get asked quite a bit and uh, by a lot of building departments and, and folks is, what if you're just changing the occupancy? You're not really touching anything, but you're definitely changing the occupancy. You're going from a retail space to an office space. You're going from an office space to you know, a hairdresser or something like that. A simple change of occupancy all by itself does not trigger the energy code, okay? Um, this is actually in the non-residential compliance manual. It says, a change in occupancy in and of itself does not trigger the energy code. Excuse me, does not trigger the energy code. It is advisable to consider the ventilation requirements of the new occupancy. For example, if a space is converted to a hair salon, the ventilation rates of the building should be considered. With new sources of indoor pollution, the existing residential ventilation rates uh, will likely be adequate for new energy for new uses. However, no change is required by the energy standards. All right, so you kind of have to look at the mechanical code in that situation, right? Okay, so what if we're just changing the HVAC system? So mechanical alterations. Most of the mechanical requirements for alterations refer back to the mandatory measures. So they're real basic. They're just saying, hey, if you're replacing this package unit, just put a new package unit in that's, that's at least the minimum that's allowed to be sold. They, they don't require any higher efficiency or stuff like that. It's just put in at least the basic system and you're good to go. So in other words, alterations mostly just require minimums for mechanical and envelope changes. Uh, same thing for envelope, okay? Uh, in some cases, duct sealing and testing is required and follows a prescriptive requirement. So there are some additional prescriptive requirements. And for alterations, you have to seal the ducts to 15, and for new construction, you have to seal the ducts to 6% of, of airflow, okay? So just be aware of that, that there are some prescriptive requirements, but for the most part, they just follow the mandatory measures, okay? All right, let's talk about HVAC changeouts. This is one of the most common types of um, alteration is just, you know, the, the old package unit gave up the ghost and they're putting a new package unit on there, or maybe they're... Um, uh, changing the, the the use of the building and they think they need more capacity. Um, and they're, so they're putting a bigger unit on there and things like that. So HVAC changeouts trigger mandatory measures and they trigger special prescriptive requirements for duct sealing and testing. Um, the form that's filled out for those duct sealing and testing is the NRC V for verification, MEC 4 hers There are many exemptions and conditions that apply and unfortunately, this is very poorly enforced. There's a lot of these types of projects going on, HVAC changeouts in commercial buildings, strip malls, you know, office buildings are constantly getting package units replaced and stuff like that. And the ducts aren't getting tested. Um, so I hope building departments will, you know, take note of this and, and realize that there are some requirements for testing and sealing of ducts. Um, and hopefully we'll we'll start enforcing that a little bit better. So here's kind of how it works. If you add or replace a condenser, coil, or air handler, which a package unit is all of those things. So if you add or replace a condenser, coil, or air handler that serves a space less than 5,000 square feet, not a building, but a space, that system serves a space less than 5,000 square feet. It's constant volume, 
It's a single system, which means not DAV, and has more than 25% of the ducts in any variety of unconditioned space. So if more than a quarter of the ducts are in unconditioned space, such as attic or up on the roof, duct sealing is required. So if you meet these requirements, again, 5,000 square feet, the system is serving less than 5,000 square feet, constant volume, has more than 25% of the ducts in some unconditioned location, such as attic or on the roof, duct sealing is required and testing by a third party, all right? So be aware of that. That's that form. If you forget those things, um, NRCV MECO 1, 4, or sorry, MECO 4, HERS, um, has that list. And then there's some exceptions. So if the ducts are moved so that they're no longer in unconditioned space, that, that actually happens. So they, they, they move the insulation or they move the ducts so that they're within conditioned space, you don't have to seal them anymore. Sometimes it's easier to do that than it is to seal the ducts. Um, if the ducts have ever been previously tested and sealed and they have an NRCV MECO for, for that system, if they do it again, they don't have to do it a second time. Okay, if they if they make changes again, so that's interesting. And then, last but not least, asbestos. Um, if you see somebody claiming asbestos, I highly recommend that you verify that there's actually asbestos on those ducts. Okay, um, that exception gets abused quite a bit. They'll they'll just say, oh yeah, there's asbestos, so we don't have to seal it, and there's not. So unfortunately, that happens quite a bit. So that's an exception. Um, so. The first thing you have to ask yourself, or one of the, the important questions to ask to determine whether or not you have to seal the ducts is, are they in conditioned space or not? So section 140.4 um, I1, or L1, sorry, um, combined surface area of the ducts located in the following spaces is more than 25% of the total surface area of the entire system. So you have to do kind of a little calculation to figure out the, the square footage of the surface area. Um, sometimes it's really easy to tell, sometimes it's not so easy to tell. Um, but if more than 25% is outdoors, so it's on the roof, okay, or, or just suspended through a, um, an unconditioned warehouse or something like that, that's um, uh, considered outside or unconditioned space. If it's in a, in, a direct, in a space directly under roof, and this roof has a U-factor greater than the U-factor of the ceiling. In other words, there's less insulation at the roof than there is at the ceiling. Okay, or if that attic has is ventilated, has turbine vents in the ceiling or events or gable and vents or something like that, that's considered unconditioned space. Uh, if it's in an unconditioned crawl space of a building, you don't see that as much in commercial buildings as you do in residential, but in unconditioned crawl space. And then last but not least, any in other unconditioned spaces. So if more than a quarter of the duct are in one of these spaces, that triggers duct sealing and duct testing, okay? The 25% the is sort of the number that they determine that it's cost effective to seal the ducts, okay? Um, but what that means is 75% is of the ducts are in condition space and only a quarter are outside. Even at that threshold, it's cost effective to seal those ducts. So um, are, the ducts are, are the ducts in condition space? Well, if the existing insulation is at the roof deck, and the ducts are underneath that, then the ducts are in conditioned space it's because the, they're, they're, the space that the ducts are in are more like the, the conditioned space than like the outside. So the insulation is at the roof deck. If the, if the existing insulation is down below the ducts at the T-bar ceiling, let's say, then that's an unconditioned attic. You would have to seal that one. If the existing insulation is in both locations, you just it's kind of a judgment call at that point, and you have to kind of decide which is the better surface, it, it, which is which is the better thermal boundary. Is it the sea, the roof where the insulation is, or is it the T-bar ceiling? Usually, it's going to be the roof because T-bar ceilings actually make a terrible air barrier. Okay, so I got some diagrams here to kind of explain that. So here's your rooftop package unit. Here's your insulation at the roof, and your ducts are down below it these ducts are in condition space because this, this attic of the ceiling is more like the condition space than it is like outside. But if we take that insulation and move it down to the T-bar ceiling like this one, so now the ducts are above the insulation, so this attic is considered unconditioned, right? If it's at both locations, you just have to kind of decide which of these 
um, boundaries, the insulated roof or the insulated T-bar ceiling is a better thermal boundary, all right? And in most cases, it's gonna be the roof because as I said, T-bar ceilings make horrible air barriers. But if this is not a T-bar ceiling, if this is a sheetrock ceiling with insulation on it, that's, that's probably a pretty good thermal boundary, okay? Then you have to kind of look and say, all right, is that attic ventilated or not, all right? So it's kind of a judgment call, but what you're looking for is, is the location of the ducts more like conditioned space or is it more like outside? Right. All right. So that was kind of a lot of information I just threw at you. There's a really, really nice summary and that Energy Code ACE puts out. And it's called the Energy Code ACE Trigger Sheet for Small Commercial HVAC Alterations. So it has this really nice little grid here where there's a description of what you're doing. And then across the top, it has whether or not you have to meet those requirements. And one of these on here, again, duct sealing and testing is at the end here, okay? So if you're doing these things, here's whether or not you have to do the duct leakage testing. There's a whole bunch of other stuff in here about uh, controls and ventilation and economizers and stuff like that. So this is a really handy little document. Be sure to get your hands on that. Go to Energy Code Ace and it's in the tools section, okay? All right, existing roofs. Um, oh, sorry, new topic here, re-roofing. Um, there is requirements if you re-roof a commercial building. It depends on how much of a re-roof it is. So existing roofs being replaced, recovered, or recoded for non-residential, high-rise residential, and hotel motels shall meet the requirements of this section, 110.8i. When the alteration is being made to 50% or more of the existing roof area, or when more than 2,000 square feet of the roof is being altered, the requirements apply. By the way, they only apply in certain climate zones, right? So you need to look at the, the tables and see which climate zones these apply in. It's usually the hotter climate zones. Um, these requirements do not apply to roofs over unconditioned spaces. So we're only talking about roof <laughs> above conditioned space, like an office or a retail space. A roof over a warehouse, an unconditioned warehouse, don't worry about it. It's not over conditioned space. You don't have to do anything with it. No cool roof requirements. Okay. Um, all right. Now let's get into lighting alterations. This is a, this is a very brief overview of this particular topic. Okay. Lighting alterations can get very complex. Um, they've been changed. Um, the first batch of lighting alterations that came out in the 2013 code, um, people didn't like them. They 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 were very complicated and they caused a lot of things to happen that was actually discouraging people from upgrading their lighting. And so they've really kind of revamped the process and the, and the requirements and they're much better. They're much more easy to apply. They make a lot more sense, okay? So the 2019 lighting alterations are fairly easy to comply. Um, it just depends on the occupancy of the building, all right? So this is a brief summary. The details of this topic are beyond the scope of this class, but can be found elsewhere. We have, a, we have an entire class on lighting alterations. Energy Code ACE has a bunch of really good resources on lighting alterations. But most of the lighting requirements for alterations, again, refer back to the mandatory measures. So just, just do the minimum things um, that are required and you'll meet the Energy Code. It's just figure out which, which ones are triggered and how to meet those requirements is the tricky part. So one of the good things is new lighting technology has improved greatly over the last few years. So you're seeing a lot more LEDs than you used to. Back in the you know, 2008, part of the 2013 code, um, in, or sorry, fluorescent lighting was sort of the, the, the default light. In, fluorescent lighting was sort of the, the industry standard, if you will, and that's what everything was compared to. Well, LEDs have come a long, long way. The prices have come down. So now LED is kind of the industry standard. They're super efficient and replacing incandescent or fluorescent with LEDs usually gives you a lot of credit. And that's, that's usually what people are doing. They just, it, it's just so cost effective that people are just doing it even though they're not, they don't have to, they're just doing it because it's a good thing to do. It's, it's, a, it's a good business decision for businesses, okay? In most lighting alteration projects, special controls are also required and the target allowed lighting power densities must be met, all right? So what 
what is considered an alteration? What triggers these requirements? How much of a change is, is required to trigger these requirements? The magic number is 10% of luminaires or fixtures within an enclosed space. So you've got an enclosed space, a, a room, or a retail space or something like that. If you're replacing more than 10% of the fixtures, it triggers these requirements, okay? Um, in, a, in a small space, 10%, if you've got less than 10 fixtures in a room and you replace one of those, that's more than 10%. So it's gonna trigger this requirement. So 10% is not a whole lot, all right? All right, so 10% of fixtures within an enclosed space is the magic number. So here's your three choices. They give you three options to meet the requirements. Let's say you're replacing all the fixtures in a room. Okay, or most of the fixtures. How do you meet the requirements? The first one is to meet the lighting power density and have some controls, okay, some special controls. So the lighting power density is watts per square foot. That is sort of what the industry has decided is a reasonable level of lighting for that type of occupancy, whether it's office space, whether it's um, retail space, whether it's a gymnasium, you know, whether it's a meeting room, um, the industry has decided that there's a reasonable amount of lighting for that type of occupancy. You go to a table, you look up that table, you look up that occupancy, and it'll say that the recommended light and power density for that space is X watts per square foot. You multiply it times the square footage of that space, and you get your allowed watts, okay? So that's kind of, think of that, that's kind of the magic numbers, the, the, the lighting power density for that space is your target, all right? So if you're, if you're replacing more than 10% of your fixtures, as long as when you're done and you have these controls, the lighting, the wattage is less than your lighting power density, you're done. That's all you have to do, okay? The problem is a lot of these old spaces, the way they're sitting right now with their old lighting is way more than their allowed lighting power density. So when you replace that, those, 10%, you've got to do a bunch of stuff to get it down below that lighting power density. But that's still, that's a good thing. If a, if a space is overlit, then it's a good idea to reduce that anyways, reduce the wattage down to what industry standard is for, for lighting power density, all right? So step one, when you're done, meet the lighting power density and have these controls. And I, I put on the side, fancy controls. There are some fairly fancy controls like occupancy sensors and daylighting controls and stuff like that. They're fairly sophisticated. They can be fairly expensive. They can be a little tricky to install in some of these applications. So what's our, what's our next choice? Well, let's say we don't want those fancy controls. What's the next choice? The next choice is to beat the lighting power density by 20%. So you've got your target. If you just barely beat it, you have to put in these controls. If you beat it by 20%, you don't have to put in those extra controls, okay? And then the last one, is just a, um, you know, it's just a lighting replacement. There's companies that go around the commercial buildings and say, hey, we'll come in and we'll replace all, we'll relamp re all your fixtures and you'll save this much money and we'll charge you this much and, and you don't have to pay us anything except what your savings is, okay? There's, com there's companies that do that. Um, the problem is, is the way the old code was written is it, it kind of discouraged that. It, it required that you put in new fixtures and I'm uh, sorry, new controls and stuff like that. When what they wanted to do is really improve the lighting efficiency of the system, um, the new code handles this much more better. And that's this uh, option number three. And what it says is be a one for one replacement of fixtures and reduce the pre alteration wattage by 40% and some less fancy controls. You still have to have your basic mandatory controls, okay? And this only applies to spaces less than 5,000 square feet. So let's say you've got a 2,000 square foot retail space and they wanna replace the, just the, the fixtures, okay? So they come in, they replace all the fixtures from old, um, old um, fluorescent fixtures, you know, the four foot tubes, and they wanna put in new LED fixtures. Well, LEDs are way more efficient than fluorescent. So if they just replace all those one for one, they will reduce it by 40%. So they're going to be 40% less. They can do that. Okay. That's, that's the other way or the other type of alteration that, that is allowed. Okay. So for, you know, if you're doing a complete relamping or re, you know, replacing all the fixtures, this 
option three here is, is you can do that. It only applies to spaces less than 5,000 square feet is, is one important trigger though. Um, but if you're just doing like, like we talked about these TIs where they're going from, you know, they're adding some office spaces or stuff like that, you're probably gonna have to hit one of these two up here above, either meet the power density requirement and have some fancy controls or beat the power density requirement by 20% and not have to have those fancy controls, okay? There's a lot of exceptions. I'm just, this. I'm really oversimplifying this, um, but um, that's kind of the, the concept. If you wanna learn a lot more about this, go into more detail. Um, there's some trigger sheets. There's some classes on just this topic, all right? Um, a lot of a lot of them aren't that complicated, but they can get complicated depending on the scope of the project, right? Section 140.6b sets the allowed lighting power density. So I was kept talking about this lighting power density. Where do I go to find that? Section 140.6b, all right? It depends on the type and the occupancy, all right? The space use and the occupancy. There are three approaches to determining your lighting power density. All right, and, and again, this is all try, just trying to make the energy code more, more um, flexible, all right? They could just say, here's your lighting power density, deal with it, but they don't. They say, here's one way to figure lighting power density, it's simple. Here's another way to, to check, to determine your lighting power density. It requires a little bit more work, but you get a better number. Here's a third way to determine your lighting power density. It requires a lot more work, but you get a much better number, uh, an easier number to, to meet, a more customized number for your specific occupancy, okay? And those three steps for determining your lighting power density are called the complete building method. That's the easiest one. That usually gives you the, the, the harder number to meet, or you can spend a little bit more time and do an area category method and get a number that's a little bit more flexible, a little, little higher number, it's a little easier to meet. Or you can go down to the you know specific, like I've got a jewelry case here. I've got um, some spotlights on some clothes over here. I've got you know this over here and get really, really precise about the type of lighting that you're using. That's called the tailored method. It gives you a much higher allowed wadding power density. All right, so whichever way you choose, you have to document it and then you'll just say, okay, here's my watts per square foot that I'm allowed to use, all right? So that's how you determine your lighting power density. Next, um, let's see, altered indoor lighting systems. This is the actual code language here. So, so those first three steps that I talked about, the hitting your lighting power density and having some controls, beating it by 20% or the relamping, re, uh, replacing all the fixtures, we're going to look right now, I'm just going to kind of show the actual code language for those three options. They're all right here in 141.0 B2L, L or I, I can't remember. Um, altered indoor lighting systems, alterations to indoor lighting systems that include 10% or more of the luminaires, we mentioned that, serving an enclosed space shall meet the requirements of one, two, or three. So one is basically meet the lighting power density, all right? and this table. And this table is where it's gonna list those controls, okay? Number two, do not exceed 80% of the lighting power density. In other words, beat it by 20%. It's just another way to say beating it by 20% is to be 80% of that number or less um, in section 140.6 and then follow that table. And what you'll notice in this table is there's a different column. For just meeting your lighting power density, there's one column. For beating it by 20%, there's another column. And I'll show you that in just a second. And then number three, here's that, the relamping or the uh, replacing all of the fixtures to make them more efficient. Here's that 40% number. So you got your, your, what's the wattage before you start? What's the wattage after you're done? If it's, if you've improved it by 40%, there's a, there's a few little controls you have to, you have to re meet but that's that third option, okay? Another thing that's uh, important to understand too is that the wiring, the wiring for the controls for the lighting and the power for the lighting, if you're messing around with that stuff, that's considered an alteration and potentially can trigger some things. New or completely replaced lighting circuits shall comply with control separation requirements. Um, so just be aware of that. If there's things you can do that trigger how the how the, the lights are switched. I'll give you some examples. Here's that table. 
141.0F. So here's that one. If you're just meeting the lighting power density, you follow this column here. If you're beating it by 20%, you follow this column here. And you've got manual area controls, multi-level controls, automatic shutoff controls, daylighting controls, demand response controls, okay? If you're just meeting the, the lighting power density, these are required. See where it says required all the way down on these, okay? But if you beat it by 20%, notice some of these say not required, not required, not required. So by beating it by 20%, it gets rid of these extra controls, right? So that's an important table to, to understand. Um, here's an example of how making a change to a space can trigger some mandatory lighting requirements when you're not actually changing the lighting. All right, let's say you've got a, let's say you've got a big office that's got two big fixtures in it, and you're gonna convert that office into two spaces by building a wall down the middle and put a door here, okay? So if you were to do that here, if you were to just put a wall down the middle and put a door over here, the switch to this office would be in the other office. That's not allowed, all right? The mandatory measure says each enclosed space must have its own switch, all right? And in addition to that, it has to be dual level switching. Every enclosed space has to have the ability to turn the lights off by about half, okay? There's some, some nuances to that. But you'll notice here that just by building this wall requires that they add two switches in each space, okay? You can't have these switches over here controlling the lights in this other office. That would be terrible, okay? So those types of things come into play as well. Energy Code Ace has a, has a really good trigger sheet for interior lighting alterations. I highly recommend that you get a hold of that, okay? Now let's do a quick example. So let's say um, we have an older building. It's got insulation at the T-bar ceiling and it's got a package unit on the roof and the ducts are in the attic, okay? So right off the bat, I would say, all right, those ducts are in unconditioned space. So if they're gonna, if they're gonna add or replace the package unit or if they're gonna move any of those ducts around, if they're gonna extend any ducts, that potentially could trigger duct ceiling. So that's an issue, all right? They're gonna move some interior walls around. They're repairing and replacing some of the ceiling tiles because they're moving interior walls around. They're gonna to have to replace some of the ceiling tiles. They're moving some ductwork and controls. So they maybe they're adding some offices and they have to put registers in each of the office to make them comfortable. And they're relocating some of the light fixtures and switches. So that's the scope. So that's the first thing you have to figure out is what are they changing? What but what part of the energy code is being affected? So you have to figure out what is the scope. And the scope of this one is moving into your walls, repairing and replacing ceiling tiles, moving some ductwork and controls, relocating some light fixtures and switches, all right? So you get that trigger sheet, follow that trigger sheet, the HVC alteration and the lighting alteration, and that'll help you figure out exactly what you need to do. But let's just kind of, kind of look at it from a conceptual point of view. So as far as the envelope goes, they said, yes, we're moving some interior walls. What the heck does that mean? Well, we've got an interior wall over here and we're gonna shift it way over here and we're gonna add one over here. So they're moving some interior walls, maybe adding some new walls, okay? Adding new walls or removing drywall to where the insulation could be installed are alterations that potentially could require energy features. So if you open up an exterior wall and expose where the insulation is supposed to be, that triggers the mandatory minimum insulation in that wall. But we're talking about interior walls here. Interior walls, normally you don't have to do anything to it. They're not separating conditioned space from unconditioned space. So you could basically move interior walls all you want and not have to worry about insulation. But be aware, some people call this an interior wall, but it's really not. A wall between an office and a warehouse. You might say, oh, that's an interior wall because it's inside the building but it's not, it's separating conditioned space from unconditioned space. That's not an interior wall. I mean, technically it's interior, but we call that a demising wall. And that, if you move that, or if you change it, or if you open it up, you have to insulate it to at least R13, okay? Uh, 
moving an exterior wall could require an addition. If you've got a wall between um, a, an office and a warehouse and you want to push that wall out into the warehouse, you just added condition space. That's now an addition. That's a different class, all right? We're talking about alterations. So do be aware of that. Uh, replacing ceiling tiles. Think of a think of a T-bar ceiling as like the sheetrock on the wall. All right. If you open up T-bar ceilings, if you replace T-bar ceiling, and there's insulation on the other require other side, it triggers the requirement just as though you were re remove sheetrock from a wall. Okay. So replacing ceiling tiles is like removing drywall on a wall, and will require that the insulation on those tiles meet prescriptive requirements for that climate zone. Only the insulation at the modified tiles need to be addressed. So if they're only replacing four tiles, you only have to insulate the top of those four tiles to, to what the requirement is. That's kind of, unfortunately, I, you know, but what are they going to do? Make, if they replace four tiles, have to insulate the entire thing. Um, so it's just those four tiles. Here's the deal, though. T-bar ceilings are a horrible air barrier. They, they're not an air barrier, they're, they're not. If there's any pressure difference between condition space and, a, and above the T-bar ceiling, air just moves freely. It's almost like it's it's like, there's less resistance through a T-bar ceiling than there is through a filter, okay, in your HVAC system. Air just passes freely between the above and below space of a T-bar ceiling. So putting insulation on top of that T-bar ceiling, it doesn't do much. It's just, it, if air is passing through the insulation, it, it doesn't filter out the heat, the air comes in at, 80 degrees and it's going to pass this and go out the other side at 80 degrees. You're just losing all that heat. All right. Um, so this, I guess the whole point of this discussion is to explain why you're no longer allowed to put insulation on a T-bar ceiling. They're not approved air barriers. If you build a new building, you're not allowed to put insulation on a T-bar ceiling because it's not an air barrier. You have to put the insulation against the roof or against sheetrock. All right. So Ceiling, ceiling tiles are not an acceptable air barrier, which is why this practice is no longer allowed. Okay, all right, HVAC. So in this example, we're moving some ductwork around. We're gonna, we're gonna move a register over to here. We're gonna maybe add a couple registers to new offices, maybe put some return grills in those offices as well. If you're extending ductwork, that triggers duct sealing and testing. It's kind of interesting. There's no specification on how long you're extending the ductwork that makes this trigger. If you're adding any length at all, it triggers duct sealing. Duct sealing in commercial buildings is kind of a pain. Um, I've watched it, I've, I've monitored it, I've tested it. Duct testing in a commercial building is kind of a pain because you have to seal off all the supply registers. And these registers are just sitting in a T-bar ceiling and they're really difficult to seal so that you can pressurize the duct to measure the leakage. Also, they're not us usually not very well connected to the back of the, of the registers and stuff like that. So duct testing in commercial buildings is kind of a pain. It's a lot of work. Um, and so I guess what I'm getting at is there's a lot of things you can do to kind of get around having to do it. And one of the things you can do is move the insulation from the T-bar ceiling is move it up to the roof level. Now your ducts are inside condition space and you don't have to test them. So that's, that's an option as well, okay? Um, but extending any length of duct, even one inch, if you add one inch of duct to the length, technically that triggers the code, but you're allowed to use common sense as well, okay? Um, making the attic condition, I mentioned this, making the attic condition volume by insulating it at the roof deck is sometimes a viable option. I've actually seen that happen. Um, I saw them do that. A, um, uh, a Kelly Moore paint store kind of sitting in the middle of a parking lot all by itself. Um, they had insulation at the T-bar ceiling. All the ducts were above that. And um, they, were, they were doing a pretty substantial remodel and um, their energy bills were horrendous to keep this place cool. It, it was in Sacramento. And um, so what they decided to do was to, instead of insulating at the T-bar ceiling as part of this remodel, is they put new insulation at the roof deck and the, and the, the walls at, above that. Well, guess what? That, that not only did that improve their thermal boundary, but it made all the ducts inside condition space. They didn't have to seal them, okay? Because that leak is going to condition space. The building was way more comfortable after they did that, by the way. Um, their loads dropped dramatically by doing that. So it's an option. It's an option. Just be aware of that. Controls, any new controls and started uh, installed as part of the alterations must meet mandatory measures. Uh, one of the big ones is the setback thermostats, right? 
Uh, all thermostats shot a clock mechanism, allows the program for four periods in 24 hours. Uh, heat pumps have special requirements for thermostats, and there's the code section for that. Uh, ventilation, technically no requirements unless the HVAC unit is replaced, all right? It may be a good idea to look at occupancy. So what we're talking about again is a TI, and the question is, do we have to address the ventilation? Um, only if the HVAC unit is being replaced, do you have to meet the ventilation requirements of that occupancy? But it's a good idea to check it anyways. And you know, you might have a package unit that does not have an economizer on it, and they're going from a retail space to a hair salon, which has very high ventilation requirements because of all the chemicals that they use. Um, the energy code doesn't say you have to have ventilation, but the mechanical code might, all right? So be aware of sort of related code issues on that, on that side. Uh, okay, here's our lighting for our example, the relocating some light fixtures and switches. Exact requirements depend on the planned installed lighting mode. So they say, okay, this is a, this is a retail space. We're allowed to have a certain watts per square foot. Um, are we going to, are we going to beat that? Okay. And, and well, you have to be, you have to be um, at least below the lighting power density. If you're just below the lighting power density, you're going to have to have some special switches, but if you can beat it by 20%, you don't have to have as many controls. Okay. This will likely mean an upgrade to meet the code and to get out of the automatic daylighting and stuff like that. Um, so re relocating some light pictures and switches. In this example, all they're doing is they're moving a wall. So they're creating a new space. Now that new space has to have its own controls. Kind of like that little diagram I showed where they built the wall down the middle of the office. So they're, they're gonna build out, they're gonna build out a wall to make an office. Now that office is gonna have a light fixture in it. It has to have its own switch. When you walk into that office, you have to be able to turn that lighting off in that office independent of the rest of the building. Uh, they will need to do a lighting power calculation and be 20% under target, okay? Um, if you can get out of daylighting um, by being less than 20%, all right? And then retrofitting with LEDs, if they go from, if while they're at it, why don't they just replace all their fixtures with LEDs? They'll, they'll beat the 20% by, by quite a bit and have much lower energy bills, okay? So LEDs are a nice way to meet that 20% requirement. All right, so doing okay on time here. Um, let's talk about the, so those are the requirements and we did an example. Let's talk a little bit about the forms, the documents that help kind of guide you through this process. Okay, you're gonna fill out, you have to fill out some forms um, to document, you know, what was required, what was installed, what was verified. Okay, let's talk about those documents. So the first one is the NRCC. If you go back to that diagram, the, the process flow chart, what is that first step? Figure out what you're supposed to do. The NRCC is kind of like, if you're familiar with the residential side of the energy code, there's something called the CF1R. The NRCC is sort of the non-residential version of the CF1R. It tells you what you're supposed to do, all right? For the prescriptive approach, there's one NRCC for each building component. So there should be one for mechanical, one for lighting, and one for envelope. Um, you can go to Energy Code Ace, and they have really, they've done a really nice job, kind of, it's kind of like TurboTax. It walks you through the process. They're dynamic PDF forms. Um, you tell, you check some boxes and say, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and that PDF will change to match what you're doing. So the parts that you don't need go away, the parts that you need open up and you can use those. So they did a really nice job with that. Um, it describes the requirements. It gives you the code section to, as references. And um, it's a good idea for building departments to require these NRCCs at the time of permit application, okay? When they come in and say, I need a permit to do this big TI, you should, really should say, where's your NRCC forms? I need to see those filled out, okay? If you decide to go to the performance approach, it's a big change and you needed to hire an energy consultant and follow the performance approach, the NRCC is gonna be called the PERF-01. NRCC PERF-01, it's generated by the compliance software, okay? It's not real common for alterations. It is common for big extensive TIs. It's more common for new construction, okay? Just be aware of that. It's a different kind of NRCC. Um, here's an example of an NRCC MEC. So this is the Certificate of Compliance for the Mechanical. So you got some general information up here. And then look, project scope. 
All they have to do is come through here and check that says, yes, I'm, a, I'm making a change to the heating system. Yes, I'm making a change to the cooling system. I'm making a change to the controls. Um, wet system and dry system. So you need, you got your like cooling chillers and cooling towers and stuff like that. It says, what are you changing? You check the boxes of the things that you're changing for smaller dry systems, um, air economizer, et cetera. Just what's being, what's part of the scope of this project? They check those boxes. And then later on in this form, it opens up those sections that tells you what are the requirements based on this stuff. So from a plan check perspective, it's important to make sure the right boxes get checked. If you look on the plans, it shows that they're, you know, replacing a bunch of ductwork, this ductwork sec box better be checked here so that it opens up that section of the form, okay? All right, the NRCA, this is that acceptance test. Acceptance test is what I mentioned earlier, is kind of like the, what we say commissioning is, you know, testing a building, making sure it's working. You know, the term commissioning comes from old Navy shipyards. They commissioned ships. So they would build a ship and it had all these sails and ropes and everything on it. And they couldn't just turn it over to the crew. They had to test it first. So they commissioned it. They tested it out. They, they sailed it around to make sure all the sails and stuff worked. That's where the term commissioning comes from. So we do the same thing to buildings. You don't just build it, install it, and let the people move into it. You got to test it out. And so part of that process, part of that commissioning process is testing the controls, testing the airflow, making sure it works. And some of those tests can be done by the installers if they're certified to do it. And some of those tests have to be done by a third party. The ones that can be done by the installer are called acceptance tests. And there's forms, NRC, oops, NRCA forms. It's similar, if you're used to the residential side, it's similar to a CF2R, okay? It ensures that the system has been properly checked and tested prior to occupancy. So if you look at an NRCA form for say, um, outside ventilation air, It'll, it'll have a very precise checklist of things that need to be done. Turn the air system, turn the system on, turn it to cooling, measure the airflow, measure the outside airflow. Does it meet this percent? Does this number greater than this number over here? If yes, check this box. You know, it's a very precise step-by-step -step instructions for how to test a certain feature in a building. So those are important and those are important for the and checker, I'm sorry, for the field inspector to ask for those forms before they file a project. So again, uh, they have compliance checklists, they're dynamic PDF files. There are some restrictions on who can complete them, okay, but not as strict as HERS testing. HERS testing is always third party. Acceptance testing, the installer can actually test their own work, but they have to be certified to do that, they have to be trained to do that. Um, again, require those at final inspection. Here's an NRCA, uh, which one is this? MECO-3, so this is the air, the um, constant volume, single zone, split air conditioner and heat pump systems, okay? Um, has a checklist for what documentation is required, that's pretty handy, all right? But this is kind of what the, the NRCAs look like. NRCV is, if you're used to the residential side, the NRCV is like the CF3R, most non-residential HERS tests apply to high-rise residential. So there's duct testing, airflow, fan wet draw, stuff like that that you would see on a house apply to high-rise residential dwelling units. So that's where you're gonna see most of these NRCVs, all right? Uh, for most typical commercial buildings, you're not gonna see too many of these unless they're replacing the HVAC system. The ducts um, must be tested by a HERS rater although they're making an exception to that so that they can be tested by acceptance test technicians too, okay, in some situations. Um, but the NRCV MEC04 um, will come from the HERS registry, just like the residential forms. Okay. Here's what it looks like, duct leakage, okay, got the system name. There's one of these for each system, all right? System name, location, indoor unit name, um, condenser nominal tonnage, leakage factor, calculated target allowed leakage, actual leakage, stuff like that, okay? All right, best practices for energy code enforcement. So best practices, determine the exact scope of work early in the project. That will tell you what you need to do. The forms can help you do that. Require the NRCC documents based on the scope. Check applicable mandatory measures, meet the prescriptive requirements, prove they're eligible for the trade-off or complete and submit a performance run that complies, all right? 
So that's kind of the, the, the overall compliance process. That, that flow diagram I showed you early on, um, that kind of is what that's describing right there. Uh, plans and specs must confirm that the applicable code elements are present in the design. So for example, if it says you have to have individual switching in these new offices that you're creating, make sure the lighting plan shows that. All right, make sure that that information is incorporated into the plans because that's where the, the trades are gonna go look. They're gonna go look at the plans. And, and so it's good to make sure that the plans match the requirements. In order to do that, it's good to have those NRCCs when you're doing the plan check, okay? Tell the applicant what the inspector is gonna look for out in the field. Collect the NRCA and NRCV documents, okay? NRC for A from the acceptance test technicians, NRCV from the HERS raters. All right, so that was pretty much it. Um, I didn't see any questions pop up, unless Sean answered them all for me. Um, yeah, so additional seeing. resources. Okay, cool, good deal. All right, uh, you guys, I'll give you my, uh, some contact information. If you guys have any questions later on, feel free. Um, some additional resources, go to Energy Code ACE, and there's these ACE tools and ACE forms. These Energy Code ACE application guides, these are really good. Um, they're more for designers, but these are really good um, compliance guides. They're, they're, they're not code. They're kind of uh, how, helping designers meet the Energy Code um, application guides. They did a really good job on these. They're very well laid out. If you go to, if you get a chance to grab a hard copy of one of these, do it because they're really nice documents, but these are all free PDF downloads as well, okay? Uh, the forms, by the way, I, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to skip over that. The forms is where you go to use those fillable PDF forms. So there, it's like TurboTax. It kind of walks you through the process. So if the designer goes to this forms ace tool, fills it out, and then gives that form to the plan checker at plan check, that helps the plan checker figure out what's required and what they're supposed to do. Uh, some additional training, 3C Ren has some trainings coming up. Bayron has a bunch of training. Even if you're not in the Bayron area, you can take some Bayron classes as well, as well as 3C Ren invites people from outside their territory. territory, territory. Um, and then Energy Code Ace has a bunch of really good training as well. Energycodeace.com. All right, um, Sean, I guess you have a class evaluation you're gonna give to them. And um, then we got some overview of some upcoming 3C Red stuff. Correct. <clears throat> All right, well, well, thank you, Russ, really appreciate it. I was taking notes the whole time. I feel like I learned a lot, um, a really uh, dense course. So if there are any questions, why don't we just stop and, and do that first? I do see a, a raised hand. Oh, awesome. Cool. Um, Mark, do you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question? Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you. Can you go over this whole thing with regards to the HERS rating? I've been on projects where, um, you know, the, I've had an energy consultant involved and I got documents back from them and they had the watermark across the documents that say HERS verification. Mm -hmm. And I just assume, like you had said, that that's got to be a third party thing. So I would then just submit it there and hope that it flies through there. But then it comes back from the building department saying, oh, no, no, those aren't done. You got to get that thing done. Well, I'm saying, well, the contractor hasn't been signed on yet. The project hasn't proceeded. It's almost like it, they weren't, it's the chicken and the, you know, or the cart before the horse sort of thing. How can we get around that? I thought, I think that if I recall correctly, I did it where I just kind of then, maybe then I signed off and said, I'll do the hers and just to get us through the plan check process. And then the contractor goes and he hires his own hers later but it just seemed like to get through the building department i had to do some tomfoolery so could you help explain that process um yeah what was that a residential project by any chance it sounds like no i think it was, was it uh it was well i've i've, I've definitely seen it on both yeah uh, you know okay. i'm on this one example i'm almost certain because yeah i didn't want to touch it on residential sure. i might be more you know uh you know amenable towards you know putting my name on something but non-residential no i'm gonna throw that to someone else sure sure it's it's a little bit different between res and non-res but it, it's essentially the same concept 
So you've got a document that tells you what you're supposed to do. And, and in residential, that's called the CF1R. In, in commercial, it's called the NRCC. And if it's like in new construction, it'll just say right on there, you need these HERS tests, okay? For alterations and stuff like that, it, it, it'll, it'll sort of does a, like a TurboTax checklist and says, okay, based on what you said you're gonna do, either you need it or you don't. And so it'll say that on the form. For, for non-residential buildings, the NRCC does not have to be registered. So when you said there was a watermark on the form, that made me think of a CF1R, which does have to be registered because all residential that needs HERS testing has to be registered with a HERS provider. And that's where you'll see the watermark. The, the CF1R, all it is saying is, here's what you're supposed to do. Um, I'm not sure what the building department was asking you to do at that point in time, except to just say, acknowledge the fact that, yeah, I'm gonna need a HERS reader on this project. Now, the next form tells you what was installed. You know, in residential, it's called the CF2R. And the installer says, I installed this, I installed this, I installed this. And then after that is the CF3R, where the HERS reader says, I tested it, it passed, here's my certificate saying that it passed. So the, it, the, what they should have been doing is asking for those twos and threes after the project was done or as the project was being completed. I'm not sure what they were asking for early in the process, except to make sure that the CF1R was registered at the beginning. Oh. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah, thank you. That probably, that may have been it, yeah. Okay, okay. because, yeah, well, well, I was gonna say, because you can, you can print out a CF1R before it gets registered and turn that in with your plans. And they may have said, oh, no, no, wait a second, this has to be registered so that we know what forms are required. Because when you register it with the provider, first provider, it'll create something called a project status report, which is a list of all the forms that need to be filled out. And that's, we train a lot of building departments to ask for that. Um, so they may have just been saying, we just want to make sure that this form is registered. Another problem that happens a lot is, they, is they, they get registered, but they get assigned to the wrong building department. So the building department can't see it. So they'll say, oh, yeah, this looks registered. It's got a certificate. It's got a watermark on it, but you may have registered it with the wrong building department. So you need to go in and change that so that they can see it. So that it might have been something like that, too. Well, yeah, because when it gets when you have to get the registered that's now that I recall there was a residential project where that registration came into play and I was I was adamant saying I don't want to I don't want to register it because I felt like wait a minute I I shouldn't be registering it. I'm not going to be the HERS grader so I really so, needed yeah so so registering the CF1R is just is that that's the list of things that you're supposed to do so usually the CF1R is registered by like the architect or the builder, the general contractor. And all they're saying is, I, I acknowledge that these are the things we have to do and I'm gonna make sure that they get done. That, that I'm, gonna, I'm gonna disseminate the appropriate information to the appropriate parties and it's gonna get done. As far as saying it passed or not, that can only be filled out by the HERS rater. Um, you can't, oh, you know what I bet it was too, is the CF2Rs are supposed to be filled out by the installers. So like, you know, your HVC contractor is supposed to sign the CF2Rs saying I did the right stuff. But sometimes they they disappear and you can't find them. Um, the CF2R can be installed by or signed by the general contractor. That sounds like what you're talking about is now you're accepting responsibility for that contractor's work, that installer's work. And yeah, I, I don't blame you for not wanting to do that. Um, so I'm just I'm kind of guessing. So hopefully that answered your question. It did. No, thank you. Thank you. Okay, sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Nope. Yeah, don't see any right now. Uh, but if there are, we'll have one more opportunity to, to ask them and answer them at the end of the course. Uh, but thank you, Mark, for that question. Really helpful. Um, and thank you, Russ. Um, like I was saying, took, took a lot of information down from this training. Um, all right, so I'm going to go through a few a quick overview of some upcoming uh, offerings and our uh, 3C Run programs. Uh, while I do that, I'll launch a quick poll for y'all. Uh, just tell us how, how we did today um, and if there's any room for improvement. We'd love, love to hear. Um, so quickly, uh, 3C Run Tri-County Regional Energy Network here on the Central Coast, we offer three programs. Um, Energy Code Connect, Building Performance Training, and Home Energy Savings. Uh, next slide. Um, 
so as you may have guessed, we we're talking about the energy code today. <laughs> so this training is offered through Energy Code Connect. We offer trainings for building professionals, public and private, uh, from architects, designers, um, plans examiners, inspectors, contractors, um, for both residential and non-residential like today. Um, and we offer energy code coach service. If you have questions from today, that's another resource for you to check out. You can ask direct questions um, for your specific projects. Um, we have our, our code coaches standing by um, to answer your questions within 24 hours. So please uh, check that out. I'll provide more information at, at the end. Uh, trainings and support like this one with experts like Russ, um, and we have regional forums, which are a bit of a, a bigger event to discuss how the energy code uh, intersects with other local policy and, and issues in our region. Uh, but simply put, we, we're, we're trying to make the energy code a bit easier to understand. And, and you know, there's a lot of questions that, that come up along the way. So please do reach out to Russ. Please reach out to our code coaches. You, you do have support for this. Um, it's perfect. Next slide. Um, our next program is building performance training, uh, serving new and existing professionals, um, specifically with a focus on some underserved and, and hard to reach workers. Uh, we get to do a little more with building performance training than just the energy code. We get to talk about uh, building as a whole, whole systems and, and develop technical skills and soft skills um, for, for our workforce. So this helps folks get into the industry, helps provide basics, um, helps folks understand new technologies. Um, and I, I, there's a lot here. So go check out on our website some of the events. You, you might um, be able to see a little more of, of what building performance training does. For example, right now we're doing a passive house uh, course to help guide folks to become certified passive house designers and consultants. So we get to do uh, a, a lot with building performance training. Um, Perfect, next slide. Um, so just encourage you to get involved. Our website is 3c-ren.org. Um, go there, you can, you can check out the calendar, the events calendar. There's also a, a form you can fill out to leave a question with the Energy Codes Coach. Um, you can attach your PDF, your plans, your documents, anything else to support your question, or you can pick up the phone and get a direct response right then and there. Um, and for our home energy savings program, um, we're still coming online with this program, but we will offer um, direct free home energy upgrades for residents shortly. Perfect, next slide. Um, so a few more notes. Uh, we do have a follow-up email that will come to you today with the slides uh, from this training with the, a recording of the training and an additional survey if there is any feedback you want to provide that's written um, or suggestions for upcoming trainings, we would love to hear. Um, and we do have a few more upcoming courses, um, like an introduction to higher performance buildings. That's a, a BPT course. Uh, we have an Energy Code 101 course, kind of developing some fundamentals, especially for newer professionals. Um, and, and some courses on ZNE trainings. But I think, Russ, you are, are teaching um, the, the HERS registry training. That is uh, specifically for public sector, um, but we do have another course later on talking about um, some, some HERS stuff too. Uh, but anyway, just keep in the loop, keep um, out for our weekly emails. We'll, we'll keep you updated with events. Uh, and then we'll have a region, regional forum for, for spring coming up too. Uh, but anyway, I do want to say thank you for joining us today. And, and thank you uh, for Russ again. Um, your expertise definitely showed today and, and found it really helpful to walk through um, the, the energy code from, from forms to, to, how to where to start and where to end. Um, but if there are any more questions, I'll, I'll stick around for a few more seconds. Feel free to, to share, um, unmute yourself. Uh, but anyway, that, that's our course today, and thank you all for joining.